Hello, my friends. Welcome to the 57th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Today is going to be a breakdown of one of my favorite conversations in this series so far. It was episode number 33 with Dr. Jody Azuni. The topic was, do mathematical objects exist? And the first half of our conversation is what I want to break down because we talk about the metaphysics of concepts and the relationship between language and the world. It's directly related to the metaphysics of mathematical objects. Dr. Azuni doesn't believe that mathematical objects exist. Most philosophers of mathematics think that math mathematical objects do exist and they exist separate of our minds. My position is a third option where I think, yes, mathematical objects exist, but they do not exist separate of our minds. Numbers and mathematical objects in general are ideas. When we stop thinking about them, they stop existing. They're mind-dependent objects. And Dr. Zuni and I have a great conversation about this notion of mind-dependent existence. If you've been following along with the show, you know I've been doing quite a lot of traveling, and I am officially now, as of this episode, back in the States. I'm back home in upstate New York. Got a few small destinations yet to go on the list, but I think things are going to be calm for at least the next couple of months. It's been a crazy journey. I obviously have lots to say, lots that I've learned over the last year, but that will be a topic for another time. Before we dive into this interview breakdown, I want to tell you about the sponsor of the show, Praxis. Praxis is all about you being able to take control of your own career, not sitting around waiting for permission to create value for people, not waiting for the credentials so that other people take you seriously. No, it's about getting your feet wet right away and avoiding the $100,000 of unnecessary college debt that most young people bind themselves to before even having any real world job experience. Instead of taking a bunch of classes taught by professors who don't really care about their subject matter or who really know what they're talking about and have never experienced the world themselves, you get to cut through all the crap and go straight to the marketplace. If this sounds like something you're interested, go to steve-patterson.com slash praxis. So let's dive into the interview and analysis of my conversation with Dr. Jody Azuni. When we use numbers and we make mathematical claims, what are the actual objects that we're talking about? Is What is a number? When we say 2 plus 2 equals 4, what is 2 in the first place? Okay. Um, I'm going to describe my position. My position is that numbers don't exist. I'm a nominalist. My position is that lots of things don't exist. All right, this is an excellent place to start. He's a nominalist, which means that, in general, what we think of as objects are really just names. That's where the term nominalism comes from. In many circumstances, I am super favorable to nominalism because if you're a nominalist, it reduces the amount of existing things that are out there. So one of the areas in my own worldview where I'm very close to nominalism is with just the existence of ordinary objects. So if I have a water bottle in front of me, I like to say that, well, there isn't a water bottle per se that's out there in the world. What, what we mean by water bottle is simply we're referencing bits of matter that are arranged in a particular way. There's no independent object that is the water bottle. The thing that is independent is just the bits of matter, the fundamental units of matter, which are arranged such that we call it a water bottle. Now, if you take that position, that means you can reduce your ontology quite a bit. In other words, you can reduce the list of things that you think exist. If there were no minds in my own metaphysics, there would be no such thing as water bottles. There would still be bits of matter and maybe even bits of matter arranged in the way that we call water bottles, but there's no independent object that is a water bottle. So, Dr. Azuni takes this type of logic and he simply applies it consistently and says, well, maybe it's the same thing with numbers, that there's really no such thing out there as a number. Now, the first thing that I want to say about this is I'm very hesitant to say things like X doesn't exist and X doesn't exist in any way. Because if we're talking about X, then it seems like we're talking about something. Now, if I were to talk about a unicorn, let's say, some, you could, 
in in usual language, we say, oh, unicorns don't exist. But if we're being super strict, my position is, yes, of course unicorns exist, but they exist in our minds. They're ideas. Those ideas that we have don't correlate to independent things in the world. There are no unicorns in the world. There's no spatially extended thing that is actually a unicorn. But of course unicorns exist. That's how we can say true and false things about unicorns is because they're ideas in our heads. My first focus in my earliest work was uh, mathematical objects. And um, I became very interested in uh, the main reasons that philosophers were pushing for why they did exist, which was a kind of indispensability mm -hmm. um, argument. Okay, so this is, I think, a pretty fair summarization. I actually ran into this argument when I was talking with Timothy Williamson at Oxford, which was what you could consider an indispensability argument. In other words, yes, mathematical objects exist, and they probably exist separate of our minds, because I can say things like, 1.8 million years ago, there were dinosaur. There were you know 448,000 dinosaurs that roamed the North America. I just made that those numbers up, but that's the idea: is we can describe things that happened in a quantifiable way a million years ago, prior to our own existence, or a billion years ago, or whatever. The argument goes: the only way we can do that is if there's some kind of real existence to numbers. Now, Dr. Zuni doesn't find that compelling. I don't find that particularly compelling, but we don't find it compelling for different reasons. In natural language, I tend to have lots and lots of examples of statements that we make that are true, that uh, use there is statements, but we don't commit ourselves and we Can don't you give intend. Can a few to. examples of that? Oh, absolutely. There are as many Greek goddesses as Greek gods. There are cartoon characters and animators who resemble one another. Okay, and that particular mm -hmm. one, the there is, is, as it's sometimes put, quantifying over both something I take to exist, namely animators, and okay. something I don't take to exist, mm -hmm. namely cartoon characters. <laughs> um, you and I might be in the peculiar position of dreaming of the same imaginary woman nightly. So we would say there is an imaginary woman we dream of mm -hmm. nightly. We mm -hmm. might compare notes. Yeah, she was wearing the same thing the other night, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are what are called hobnob puzzles due to uh, Geech, which say things like, Nob thinks that a certain witch has poisoned his pig, and Hob worries that the same witch has killed his cow, where the speaker doesn't think there is a witch. And so there's lots of examples like this where uh, items that are playing these quantifier roles are nevertheless, fun and the sentences are non-committing, but true. And that's key. Excellent examples. In fact, I would probably use these examples if I were to make my own points in metaphysics because they're so good. So usually when we're talking about fictional characters, we're talking about um, the witch with the, the poisonous brew that poison to the apple, we say things like, oh, well, that which doesn't exist. But that, to me, is just not philosophically precise. What we really mean to say is the idea that I'm talking about in my head has no physical correlation or independent existence outside of my head. That's what we mean by there's no witch. You know, witches don't exist. Well, that means the very clear concept and idea that I'm talking about, that I could say true and false things about in my head, does not correspond to the world. But this is a very different perspective of saying those ideas that we're talking about don't exist at all. You have to assume a kind of all existent things are phys physically or spatio-temporally existent in order to make this nominalism work. So this forces you into positions like, well, ideas don't exist. Why is it that ideas don't exist when we can talk about them and we live in the world of ideas? Well, ideas don't exist because they don't have physical spatio-temporal existence. I just find that a really weird use of the term exist. You can, you can, I'm fine if we want to give that word exist, but then what is the nature of ideas? What is the metaphysical ontological status of ideas if we're saying, oh, they don't exist because they don't have these particular properties? Okay, well, there's still some things. They still have to have some kind of properties. So what is the nature of those properties?
there's a lot of philosophical flanks to fill here. Yeah. <laughs> How do these things get to be true if there's no objects that are being right. talked about and you have to tell a story? And um, how do these truths operate with, um, uh, with sentences that are this way? How can we have the kind of attitudes we have towards these things if they don't exist? Sure. So I tell stories about all these things. This is why I spend so much time writing philosophy because the nominalist position, if you go this route, opens up a lot of other things you have to tell stories about. Okay, so he gets this, right? He gets that it seems like when we're talking about things, we have to, that those things have to exist. And so he says we have to tell stories. Now, this is kind of the first red flag where I'm don't, I'm very skeptical of the idea of we have to tell stories. That's at least certainly not the way that I would put it. And, and something that I've noticed in the world of philosophy, in the world of ideas in general, people love storytelling. They love, there's a, there's a kind of playfulness. There's a kind of um, almost childlike playfulness to, a way, to the way that a lot of philosophers and thinkers approach their subject matter. There's kind of a, I guess you could call it a lack of seriousness. Now, my disposition is to say, don't tell me any stories. I don't want to hear the stories. <laughs> Just tell me the facts. Tell me the arguments. Explain it to me in a nonfiction way. But this is his, his chosen method is to try to tell stories. So maybe it's just a stylistic difference, but it's not exactly my cup of tea. So there's something I call the aboutness illusion, which I think very powerfully drives not just the, uh, uh, the need to believe in mathematical objects, but the, the need to believe in fictional objects. Mm -hmm. And the aboutness illusion takes the following form. Let's say you and I agree there's no Hercules. And let's say you and I agree there's no Pegasus. There's no object in any sense at all. So there's nothing that has properties. Because if it doesn't exist at all, it doesn't have any properties. Okay. Nevertheless, we have a rather unavoidable cognitive impression that if I say Pegasus doesn't exist, I'm speaking of something specific that doesn't doesn't exist. <laughs> and if I say Hercules doesn't exist, I'm speaking of something else specific that doesn't exist, not the same as the Pegasus. Okay. But if you're going to strictly say these things don't exist, that's not correct. Okay? Now, that cognitive illusion, I think, drives a lot of very weird philosophical positions. Minongianism views that fictional objects do exist because yes. how, how else could... Or the hallucination. Is that a di dagger I see before me? He's thinking of a specific non-existent object that's floating right there. This is very powerful. Now, I don't actually see the problem here to say, yes, well, we have this overwhelming urge to say, you know, the, the ideas do exist, the Pegasus does exist because it's distinct from Hercules, but that only presents us with a problem if we accept off the get-go that existing things must physically exist. <laughs> if we are non-physicalists, if we say, well, some things can exist that aren't physical, this presents no problem. Because as I've said a couple of times already, Pegasus exists as an idea in our head. Pegasus does not exist as a physically existent object in the world. There's no issue there. I don't know anybody that would disagree. I don't know anybody that thinks Pegasus actually exists independent of our mind. So this doesn't strike me as an illusion. The aboutness illusion doesn't strike me as an illusion at all. It just strikes me as a feature of language that not everything we're talking about has a physical correlate, and yet we can still talk about it because it has a mind-dependent existence. We have to ask you, what do you mean by exists? Because if we're talking about something, isn't a, isn't a necessary part of a something being a something is that it is. It is existent. How can you have something that isn't? Well, that's right. But keep in mind what's going on here is when you say, how can I have something that isn't? I can't. How can I use the word something to talk about what doesn't exist? I can, okay. but let's not put it that way. Let's put it a different way, a way that's going to uh, push back on this temptation, which is let's just talk about the fact that some of our names don't refer and some of our terms don't refer, okay? okay. So when I use the word Hercules and mm -hmm. I use the word Pegasus, mm -hmm. these don't refer to anything. Well, I won't grant that uh, Pegasus and Hercules don't refer. I would say by virtue of the fact that they are terms that have meaning, they're referring to something. 
However, I thought it was uh, reflective of his capacity as a philosopher when he said, well, we can't say that there is something that isn't. He said, you, that would be impossible. But, he's, but what he's saying is, well, then how can we use the word something to talk about what doesn't exist? Now, while that, I think, is, is clever and he grasps the, the issue at play here, I think he just hides behind a word. So he says, how can we use the term, the word something, to talk about what doesn't exist? Another way you could phrase that is by saying, how could we use the term something to talk about things that don't exist? So obviously you can't talk about a thing that isn't because it wouldn't be a thing. So he says, well, how can we talk about what doesn't exist? Well, what is the what? We talk about non-existent what. That still, to me, implies thingness. And now what we're really focused on is the question of how can a sentence like Pegasus is depicted in ancient Greek mythology as a flying horse. How can that sentence be true if there's a word in it that doesn't refer? And that's a different question. And now I have to tell a story, and I do tell a story which involves something I call truth-inducing, which okay. is we, we, we do fiction and we do mythology, and then we talk about the mythology, and in particular we talk about the contents. And the way we do it is we formulate terms that don't refer to anything, and we um, uh, give them a truth value based on the nature of the story. Okay, so he tries to get around this metaphysical problem by saying, well, what truth and falsehood have to do with in fiction is talking about whether or not our claims cohere to a story, not whether or not our claims cohere to some kind of objects in the world. Trouble is, what is a story? A story is not some physically existent thing, and it still puts, I would say, my resolution perfectly solves this. I also would claim that propositions about Sherlock Holmes aren't true or false based on whether or not they objectively cohere in a physical way to Sherlock Holmes that existed in London. Of course, that's not true. My claim is precisely the story in our head, the concepts and ideas that we're conceiving of, we can say true and false things about. But those concepts are themselves objects. When I'm thinking about a red elephant that speaks English, that concept is an object in my head. That's why I can say it would be false to claim that the red elephant speaks Spanish, because in my head, the red elephant speaks English, not Spanish, and he's not bilingual. This also satisfactorily gives you a metaphysical status of the story. If truth and falsehood are about coherence to a story, well, you still have to place the story as an existing thing somewhere, right? Well, this is very easy in my own worldview. Stories are in our heads. Without minds, there would be no such thing as stories. There might be ink on paper, but there wouldn't be the concepts and ideas that we're talking about when we're talking about stories. So okay. that we can say correctly, Sherlock Holmes is depicted in the Arthur Conan Doyle stories as a detective living in Victorian England, okay? Of Victorian London, let's say. So we can say something like that. And now I'm talking about a sentence. I am not talking about an object. Now, psychologically, we experience it a certain way. We're thinking about, just as we do with novels, we recognize these things don't exist, and yet we think about them. He said, so we're talking about a sentence, not an object. And again, what is a sentence? If we're talking about a sentence, as a thing is distinct from other things, that strikes me as an existing thing. And again, sentences are my independent objects in my worldview. They don't exist outside of our conception of them, but they certainly do exist while they are being conceived. So would you say then you can't reference Sherlock Holmes outside of a sentence or outside of a story? Or that? Well, no, you don't reference him, period. But there are sentences in which the word occurs which have truth values. 
okay? And those sentences get their truth values in some derivative sense from the stories. But you can compare Sherlock Holmes across stories. You can talk about Sherlock Holmes in movies. Well, okay. You can compare Sherlock Holmes. I can say Sherlock Holmes is depicted in all the fiction he appears in as far smarter than Donald Trump is depicted in anything that talks about him. Perfectly good sentence. Well, <laughs> when you say one that's not true because of <laughs> as it turns out. Well, when you say stories that's depicted in stories, that's does, right. does a story have an existence then? Let for the sake of our conversation, let's take stories to exist. What they okay. actually are yeah. might be um, uh, words on paper, interpreted sentences, etc. So there you go. I think this position is kind of forced, that you're kind of kicking the can down the road of what things exist. And he says, well, they might be interpreted words on paper. I say, okay, what is interpretation? In my worldview, at some point, you're going to bump up against the non-physical. You're going to bump up against, well, what we're talking about is an idea, is a concept, is some part in our mind and not some physically existing thing. And he wants to try to get around that and say, well... Yes, stories are the things that exist, but what we mean by the stories is the ink on paper or interpreted words. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite clear on the uh, interpretation end of what he means by that. But to me, it just seems like kind of bending over backwards to explain away any type of mind-dependent existence. I have very radical views about what ends up existing at well, the I end of the them. day. Okay, well, I have a book. <laughs> I have a book, which unfortunately I don't have here, so I can't give it to you, but I can always send it to you if you give okay. me the address, sure. called Semantic Perception, How the Illusion of a Public Language Arises and Persists. So that also focuses on certain other class of what I call cognitive illusions. Um, what's going on in semantic perception is the idea is you and I have uh, basically language organs. I'm going to use Chomsky-style language here. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of what Chomsky has to say about this. We have, as it were, each of us has a faculty, a language faculty. What it produces is we end up competent in an idiolect, an individual idiolect. I have mine, you have yours that's going on here, they overlap sufficiently that we enjoy successful communication, but they're not exact. But that's not our experience. Our experience is very different. Our experience, you're an English spe native English speaker, you have an involuntary experience of meaningful words on a page. Mm -hmm. There is no object like that in the world. Okay, there is design, there is just um, um, uh, ink on a page here. Um, nevertheless, we involuntarily project that into the world and we furthermore have the experience, I have the experience that this has a meaning as well as, uh, you know, a grammar, but I'm really focused on its meaning and I am experiencing you in the successful communication as having a seeing the same thing that I am, just as I see you as seeing this pen just as I do. But that is a, a almost, I want to call it a collective hallucination. That, that object is not out there. Again, I think this is a really interesting position because I actually agree with a lot of it, except that I think it implies non-physical existence. When he says, you know, meaning isn't out there in the world, we project it. Well, what does that mean? What, First of all, how's that possible? I'd love to know the philosophy of mind behind this. But the idea that meaning isn't out there, and yet meaning is certainly a word that has meaning to describe some difference in the universe, well, doesn't that get you to the contents and goings-on of our mind are not objective existent things out there, that there isn't meaning in the world, but there's certainly meaning, and there's certainly meaning in our heads, so doesn't that imply this divide between what exists in the world and what exists in our mind. But to turn around and take this hard nominalist position and to say the meaning that is in our heads is projected onto the world, but the meaning doesn't exist, strikes me very, very oddly. Is your claim that what you could call concepts, maybe, right. that those don't actually exist? Um, I'm, I was focusing specifically on public language. Okay. 
Uh, concept, if we think of it as a mental entity, I yeah. mean, concept in philosophy, there's a use of it where it's a kind of public entity. But, you know, concept, actually concept is this mongrel concept <laughs> that's used in all <laughs> sorts of ways. But if you're thinking of it as a mental entity, there is this, um, we have a psychological theory, a folk psychological theory which uh, talks about all sorts of entities, images, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What that, if that theory actually refers to anything mm -hmm. or not, I'm not prepared to say. Okay. I love this little comment. Uh, I've bumped into it a few times. Folk psychology. You know, whenever you're talking about ideas, beliefs, images in our minds, it gets called folk psychology, and he's not prepared to talk about it. This, I think, reflects a shortcoming in the theory that we're listening to, that there wouldn't be uh, a position on folk psychology, namely, what are ideas, what are concepts, <laughs> uh, strikes me as a gross shortcoming. And the reason, in my opinion, it's called folk psychology is precisely because it appears like the things we're talking about are non-physical. And so therefore, if you're talking about non-physical things, you must be talking about some folksy superstitious theory that isn't scientific because everybody knows that all existent things are spatio-temporally existing and if you say otherwise you're some kind of a religious or spiritual nut job that's talking about folk psychology the more i dive into this actually i, I find it um shocking just how dismissive a lot of intellectuals are i'm not claiming this is um, dr azuni i actually found him quite reasonable but so many intellectuals are scathingly dismissive of folk psychology that is if i were to say something like Ideas exist and they drive your behavior. Beliefs exist and they're the most important thing in your life. Folks, this is just folk talk here. What is a belief? Well, that's just this word that the simple bumpkins use to talk about some mental phenomena that's happening. But everybody knows ideas don't really exist because that would imply non-physical existence. The whole theoretical power of positing the existence of ideas and beliefs is overwhelming. I mean, to have a worldview in which ideas don't exist is to have a grossly stunted worldview. And yet that, when you push people who investigate this area and who are part of the orthodoxy, they don't like the idea that ideas exist or beliefs exist or beliefs drive people's behavior. My claim, maybe this is because I'm a folksy bumpkin myself, my claim is if you actually investigate folk psychological theories about what people report their mental goings on to be, well, actually, that gives you an incredible um, theory about how the world and how the mind works. I think there's much more theoretical power in people describing their introspective experiences than there are these <laughs> uh, many times dogmatic scientists and thinkers who assume off the get-go that all existing things must be physical. I think that stunts their ex the explanatory power of their theories. What I'm focusing on specifically here is that when you talk about a public language, which we do, and we talk about sent we talk about English, and we talk about the grammar of English and the meanings of words that are held in common, and we talk about if we talk about the practices that we engage in where we defer to others sometimes on the meaning of a word. I had this tendency to think of a tomato as a vegetable, but in point of fact I'm wrong and it's a fruit. Right, we're deferring to certain botan uh, botanical, I'm not going to say that right, <laughs> experts. That object does not exist, is what I want to say. So when, when the sentence, though, that object does yes. not exist, makes me think, well, then it isn't an object. So no, it, is, it isn't an object, but we experience it as an object, and we talk about it, and we rely on it, and we communicate with one another. Okay. And, and so we have certain experiences which we indispensably have to describe a certain way. But if I were to step back and do linguistic theory uh, about this kind of public object or pragmatics or whatever, my theory would talk about public objects that would quantify over them just as if I were writing an essay on uh, a, a, sh a novel of Dickens, I would talk about the characters and quantify over them. And in okay. both cases, those things don't exist, even though I say the sentences will be true. And I mean, that's one theory that just strikes me as unnecessarily convoluted, and it still doesn't 
solve the problems that I want to see solved, why don't we just say tomato is a word that we use to describe a concept in our mind. That concept may or may not have an external referent in the physical world. If in our conception of tomato we have, you know, tomatoes are living creatures that uh, like to go to amusement parks on the weekend and talk with one another, that concept exists, but it does not correspond to anything outside of our conception. It does not have an external referent. But if we think of a tomato as some assortment of particles that once assorted has the properties of being red, being slightly squishy, having seeds on the inside, being farmed by lots of people, being a staple in uh, hamburgers, have to have tomato. If that's what I mean by the concept in my head, then that does have an external referent in the world. Were I never to exist and no minds were to ever exist, then the concept of tomato wouldn't exist. The taxonomic distinction of tomato would have no type of existence. But to the extent that tomato references external phenomena in the world, bits of matter arranged in particular ways, then that phenomena would still be there without our minds. To me, I've, I've run this theory by lots of people, both in the, in the interviews and not in the interviews, haven't heard a good objection to that. Moving from fictional characters, do you also have the same perception, uh, 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 perspective on something like government? Does government exist? Y governments, countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have not yet started to write about uh, social ontology. I'm approaching it. Okay. Um, I'm intending to write about it very shortly. But the answer is yes. The situation is a little more complicated because um, there's a sense in which we, there's only, it's only a sense though, it's not absolute, in which we take countries or think of them at times as composed of people or composed, uh, 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 constituting a territory. Again, it turns out it's a very complicated notion. In fact, uh, just uh, so a notion of a city like London is very complicated. This is the sort of thing yeah. that, that Chomsky has pointed out, and that um, it's playing a, a, a multiplicity of uh, ontological roles, and it's very shifty. But in point of fact, uh, and so when you analyze uh, what we would be um, dealing with here, um, there's going to be, the only way to put it now, um, uh, just informally, is that there are aspects of it that exist and aspects of it that do not. This again strikes me as a bit unnecessary, the way that I would put it. I don't, I don't find it difficult. It's to say that government is a concept in our head. We have all kinds of abstractions that are unique to the individual. What I mean by government is not what you might mean by government. But those concepts should at any point be able to be brought back to their concrete reference in reality. This is actually one of the errors that people make is they talk about government as a floating abstraction. That is some independently existing thing in the world separate from individual people and their behavior. So usually if I'm talking about government, I'm talking about the actions of actual individuals, or I'm talking about rules of the game. What are rules of the game? Well, I think they can be found in people's minds. Laws, for example, I think ultimately are beliefs. They're commonly held beliefs that restrict individuals' behaviors. So at any point, you should be able to draw your abstractions back into grounded in reality. But to say some parts exist, some parts don't exist, I prefer the language of saying the, the concept of government exists, some parts of my concept refer to independently existing things, and some parts of my concept surely don't refer. I'm sure part of my conception doesn't actually refer to parts in reality. I'm sure I don't have a perfect conception of government. But I think it's more philosophically precise to say that sometimes our concepts refer or don't refer versus saying exist or doesn't exist. Okay, so what I'd like to do is present to you okay. something that I want you to tell me why I'm wrong, because okay. I don't like the idea of Platonism. Okay. And I don't like the idea, well, I like the idea of nominalism, but I don't like sentences like, we can say true things about non-existent, right. non-object. Well, well, that's a misleading way of putting it. Okay. 
the right way to put it is that we have sentences that are true with terms in them that don't refer. Okay, so that, that is That's much more... That's the way that... With because much more precise you're right, the it. other way of putting it... Well, it's not that the other way is imprecise, it's that the other way invites a position, which philosophers have adopted, that, well, there are two kinds of objects. There are ones that exist and ones that don't. Or there are ones <laughs> that have being and ones that don't. Or maybe they, none of them have being, but then they are, in some sense, or have properties, yes. even though they don't exist and don't have being. Being. And I don't want to say any of this. All of this to me is crazy metaphysics. Okay, so, but I think there's another option here. Okay. This is my own position. All right. That mental objects have a mind dependent existence. So when we're talking about something like government or we're talking about something like Pegasus, Pegasus exists, but what I mean by that word is a mental unit in my mind. Don't want to be, say that. Okay, so why is that? Why don't you like that? Why you don't want to say that is that sounds like what's called a use mention error. And so it goes something like this. Let's start with the keys on my desk mm -hmm. over here, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly have a concept of them. I have an idea of them. Mm -hmm. And that's a mental entity, and that's probably dependent on my mind in the sense that you're describing, although, you know, I'm going to have problems with that. But Let's mm -hmm. not worry about that mm -hmm. because that's not important. Okay. The crucial thing is that we want to distinguish the keys, the physical keys from the mental entity. Mm -hmm. So there's at least two things that we're talking about here. And when I say the keys exist or the keys are heavy or any other number of things about the keys, I am not talking about the mental entity. The mental entity has a different set of properties. So here's how I might respond to that. Right. And so I want to say with pe Pegasus, yeah. you've got the mental entity, but you don't have the Pegasus. So, that's the difference between the keys and the Pegasus. Okay, so that's a position that actually I think Timothy Williamson said as well, is a use mention error, but here is my response. What do you think about something like this? Sure. That there are different types of existence. So you have a spatial existence. Yeah. The keys have, <clears throat> the keys... Keys are spa have spatial, spatial existence, existence sure. and fictional and, objects have fictional existence. Or they, what I would say is they have a conceptual existence, they yeah. have a mental existence there that is not are, spatially located There anywhere. are philosophers who, who at least sound like this. Yeah. As I said, you find a philosopher for any position <laughs> because logical space, surprisingly, logical space is as... Um, rare and expensive as um, apartments in Manhattan, <laughs> for whatever reason. So you'll find, every space you'll find some philosopher. I don't, I'm um, a person who thinks, and now I'm going to try to trot out linguistic evidence for this, that that's not how the word wor exists works. Exist does mm. not have many meanings. Do mm. Exist does not have many uses. It has, it is not ambiguous. Now, well, from my perspective, that's not really a response. Uh, he's just saying, well, okay, yeah, that, that's a position that some philosophers have. I don't have that position because I think existence has one type of meaning. Well, first of all, I disagree that existence has one type of meaning. I think very few words have one type of meaning, and I very strongly don't use the term exist to reference only spatiotemporally existing phenomena. But second of all, okay, well, so I guess it's not a use mention error. This is the, this is the same resolution I wanted to bring up with, and I was talking to Dr. Williamson about it. This seems to me, this position strikes me as perfectly logically consistent, explanatory of uh, all phenomena, makes a nice distinction between physical existence, non-physical existence, mind-dependent versus non-mind-dependent. I can explain fictional characters fine. I can explain concepts fine. I've yet to bump into the theory, to the phenomena that I can't explain perfectly consistently and well without much difficulty within this way of thinking about the world. There are multiple types of existence, spatial, non-spatial. So at the very least, I'm glad to see that he recognizes, okay, well, in this circumstance, not a use mention error at all. Recall the example I gave to you a little earlier where I said there are cartoon characters and animators who resemble one another. One use of there are covering both mm -hmm. two different kinds. And you can yes. also say the same thing with exist. Yes, I totally agree. That so, that, but, but what I would say is all that's reflective of is an imprecision of language that comes up um, in circumstances like this. So the, the way we clear that up is not by saying, oh, 
exist is intrinsically ambiguous, we just say, oh, well, we have to specify what we mean by the term. So if I say something like, you know, uh, Harry Potter has square glasses, yeah. that's a false sentence. I could meaningfully say, no, that's false. Harry Potter has round glasses. Right. What I mean by Harry Potter seems like a very clear concept. It's some kind of a mental unit that I can describe in various true or false ways. Other people might share that concept in their own minds. They can and there's going to be this overlap between your concepts and my concepts. But we don't have to say Harry Potter doesn't exist. What I'd say is Harry Potter, does, has, that term has no spatial referent. That term is right. just a pure conceptual. Look, yeah. this is a view. Um, <laughs> this is a view. Okay. And you can even inoculate the view against the linguistic evidence. You don't have to call language imprecise, which seems mean. You can say, well, we're going to revise the language or regiment it. We're going to allow exists to work this way. Your metaphysics, in a way, is going to drive your revisions Definitely. in language. Yeah. That can happen. This is one of the reasons I said earlier, this is one of the, my favorite conversations I've had because he gets it. He's totally aware of these arguments and he can say things like, yep, this is a coherent position what you're talking about. You know, you've carved out a niche here that is actually coherent. And he and I are both in agreement that we, we are not Platonist. He's, he's even more strongly averse to, uh, to Platonism than I think I would be because he's going even more extreme than I am in my, in my own metaphysics. But it's nice to be able to say, okay, yes, your position is internally coherent, but I disagree with it for these reasons. I think I would say the same thing for the most part with his position, that I don't, I don't think I've found any kind of logical contradiction here. It just strikes me as a very odd use of language. And it seems like a lot of our disagreement is about the use of language and its relationship with the world. I'm going the other way. I'm going to say, you know what? I can get by without messing with existence. Now, parenthesis, I have other arguments about this. I, I have trouble understanding different notions of existence. To me, what you're describing is something that exists in the same way but has different properties. It's mental or it's in space and time. Hmm. And so I'm saying, you know, that's actually your position. Your position is actually just good old-fashioned. You believe in different kinds of objects. Some of them are mental, some of them aren't, some of them are numbers, and okay. you're, you're labeling it. Now, I want to... I. In the, my back pocket, I haven't mentioned this, I have a criterion for what exists, which is not is in space-time, okay. but which would sound like it would just blatantly beg the question against you. I have a position which is something like, um, if something exists, it's mind and language independent. We have to, we don't get to dictate its properties, it gets to tell us what its properties are and we have to find out. So you reject the category of fiction. Of all mind dependent. You say mind dependent existent is an, those things. Yeah, that's not. There is no such thing as a mind dependent thing, except in the following sense. And this is why I wasn't ruling out mental en entities necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, look, I make a chair. The chair is, in a certain sense, carpenter dependent. That is to say, the chair would not have existed unless the mm. carpenter would have brought it into existence. Okay. I don't think that makes its existence dependent in any way, except causally. In the same way, if there was no Big Bang, there would be no me. This is a pretty clear differentiation of our positions. That he's saying, okay, well, mine, there might be something that is mind dependent in the sense that minds brought it about but not that their existence is dependent on a mind. And my position is, yes, in a very explicit, extreme way, lots of phenomena have a mind-dependent existence, meaning they definitely exist when they are being conceived, when they exist in somebody's mind, and they definitely do not exist when they are not being conceived. So, for example, my sensory experiences. Sensory experiences are something. Sensory experiences exist but they don't exist when they aren't being experienced. They only exist when they are being experienced. That's something like a mind-dependent phenomena. I think there's quite a lot of mind-dependent phenomena out there, but he's kind of ruling that out as a, as a whole category of thing just straight off the get-go. In that way, 
I can see mental events under a different description, perhaps, as brain episode, as episodes of a brain. Brain neurons fire, blah, blah, blah. That's an episode. And it may be, although I'm not positive this will ever work out, okay. and I think it might not, that mental the 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 folk talk about ideas yeah. and impression will all turn into uh, episodic uh, descriptions of episodes, and then that depends on what episodes are. So that would be the way I go. Now, when it comes to therefore fictional entities, again, I want to say what makes the Potter claims true or false is the. Uh, the movie and storytelling discourses that have been created and then do these sentences describe things correctly or not that are taking place in them. Not do they describe Harry Potter correctly because there is no Harry Potter, but do they correspond in the right way to the sentences which occur in the Harry Potter stories. Okay. That's the story I'm going to tell. Okay. So what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, I think you can tell your story, I can tell my story. The where I would want to apply pressure against you in argument would be with my criterion. Okay. All right, so that's kind of his position. You know, he tells his story, I tell mine. And then for the sake of this interview breakdown, this is the last segment that I want to uh, analyze right here. Okay, so when you are thinking about creativity, human, okay. human creation. Sure. Because I have this wiggle room in my metaphysics for mind-dependent things, I would say something like, you know, I can actually conceive of, let's say, a song that hasn't been written or a song that's in my head. Sure. I mean, it's, not been, it's never been fully there, but I can almost, in a sense, hear it. Right. I can say all those things with a language of like, yeah, well, in some sense that song exists. That's what I'm referencing. That's what I'm super, like, so pseudo hearing. But it, th th its existence doesn't have any spatial referent yet. How do you think about, you know, creative objects? Like, yeah, creative objects, it's going to depend on the object. Um, let's, let's assume that an object is a, um, certain, the objects we're talking about here, there are such objects, are... Um, are, are time bounded. They come into existence at a certain point. They go out of existence mm -hmm. at a certain point. And so, and let's say these are the things we create. This is a, a very simple toy model because I think there are things we create that don't exist in a certain sense. Again, I'm speaking in this uh, terrible way, <laughs> but I can anticipate. And there are things we say, like, you know, the house I am going to build is one I can barely afford. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a statement about a future house. Okay, I am able to refer to. Um, there are real questions about am I actually referring to it, you know, because it exists in the future. Let's say it really does exist. Mm -hmm. And then I, maybe I'm able to refer to something in the future. Uh, at the present moment, and that would be an actual object that I was referring to. It may be the house never comes into being. In that case, I'm not referring to something, okay? But nevertheless, what I'm saying is true because uh, one of the reasons the house never got built was because I couldn't afford it, <laughs> right? So what I'm going to do in these cases, and, and you know, if you think about the creation of fictional characters, which I treat as creation, those are the creation of things that don't exist. And what we're going to describe instead, if we say, well, what did the person create? metaphysically. Well, it depends. If it's a story, it's a bunch of sentences or it's ink on paper that's interpreted or whatever. And then it, uh, uh, it's something that we allow to accrue over time the way we would treat it. Um, in other cases, we're just going to um, talk about a practice that we can carry on of a certain sort, a way of talking. And that's what we're actually creating when we're creating these Okay. These objects. I do not think it's the case that writers ultimately, metaphysically, are creating ink on paper. I think that, in fact, completely misses the point of what these types of creations are. Stories, 
are mental things going on in our head. When we talk about a story, we talk about a song, we talk about a painting, we're not really talking about ink on paper, paint on canvas, some squiggles on some bars. We're talking about the mental goings on. To understand an incredible song as only sound waves and not the mental phenomena that happens once the sound waves are experienced, I think is to misunderstand what a song is. Just like I think it's a misunderstanding of what a story is to ultimately try to metaphysically say uh, it's actually ink on paper or ways of talking. But again, this is kind of coming from metaphysical position. I always want to reduce my ontology, and he wants to reduce his ontology even more than mine, but I think at the expense of a really powerful way of talking about the phenomena we experience. Human life, I think, is completely wrapped up and driven by all of these mental goings on. I think if you were to talk to any artist or any writer, um, they would have a very difficult time saying that fundamentally all they're doing is arranging ink on a piece of paper. And I don't think that's what they're doing. I think one way of bringing their creation into existence and into the minds of other people is by rearranging ink in a particular way. But it's so that that rearranged ink will elicit the concept in the mind of the reader. That's the whole point of the matter. But I think you guys get it. I won't beat a dead horse. This is the really only about half of the conversation. The other half we were talking about philosophy and metaphysics of mathematics, which was also interesting, but it's going to be a pretty hard change from the tone of this um, uh, breakdown. So I want to end it here. And someday, hopefully, I'll get around to breaking down the second part of our conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed this analysis. I think I loved this conversation with Dr. Azuni. It's great to run into somebody that has even more uh, extreme, pared-down uh, metaphysical views than I do, and somebody that has a clear grasp of language. I really appreciated a lot of his linguistic precision and his attempt and capacity to follow along and really make for a fantastic conversation. So what do you guys think? Do you think mental objects exist? Do you think there's a, such a thing as a mind-dependent existence? When you think about the story of Harry Potter, fundamentally, are you talking about words on paper? Or are you talking about a, a uh, film that's played in your head, if you will, and played in the heads of other people? If I were to say Pegasus is a blue walrus, I'm saying something false, in order for something to be true or false, does that imply some type of metaphysical existence? And if so, what type of metaphysical existence? That's my analysis. If you like these breakdowns, you like the episodes, do make sure to leave a comment, subscribe. You can support the show at patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. Also, feel free to shoot me an email about your thoughts about any of the episodes I've run these metaphysical ideas by many people on my travels, even in lots of conversations, even if I'm just talking about mathematics. I think it fares pretty well, so I want to keep putting it to the test. That's all for today, guys. Have an excellent week.